after that, we'll begin working in opening attention getters and closing attention getters. That's where chapter two comes into play because the bulk of chapter two is about what are my options for opening attention getter and closing attention getter. We had some quotes. Some of the quotes were quick to the point by people we knew, like Dr. Seuss, Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi. You don't have to explain who those people are because we know. And if the quote is quick and to the point and it sums up something in a line or two, that's good. If it's a paragraph, that's probably not a good quote for that opening attention getter, which is supposed to catch our attention and lead us directly into the topic. But now your closing attention getter, you already have our attention, we know what the topic is and you're trying to sum it up. So a longer quote would be appropriate there. Or a quote where you need to set up, here's who this person is. If you were trying to do a speech on space travel and you wanted to talk about quantum physics and you're quoting the person who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2018, I don't know who that person is. I wouldn't recognize their name. So you would need to tell me this is who the person is. Maybe even tell me what they were working on and how that relates to your topic about space travel. So that kind of a quote that needs the explanation and setup would probably need to be at the end of your speech, not the beginning. Some of the things we talk about in chapter two, quotes obviously are one of your possibilities for an opening attention getter. And I use that because we just talked about quotes today. You've also done a joke. Jokes are an option. Um, we talked about having a, the assignment for the joke was a clean, non-offensive joke. The goal of an opening attention getter is to get the attention of your audience, draw them into your topic, get them on your side. You don't want to offend someone right off the bat. So that's where the clean, non-offensive comes into play. If in doubt, go on the safe side. One semester I had a student who was going to tell a joke and he asked, is, he was going to tell a Polish joke. He said, is anyone here from Poland? And he's expecting no one to raise a hand, but I had a volleyball player from Poland and she raised her hand. Now he is stuck because he doesn't have a backup joke and he is asked. If you're gonna ask, then you need to be prepared to make a change if somebody responds. He was not prepared, so he told the joke anyway, and now what might have been sort of offensive is even more offensive because he asked first. So the best plan would be just don't tell a joke that might offend someone. Also, the first assignment, jokes didn't have to be funny. If you're gonna use it as an opening attention getter, it should be funny. If you try it out on several people and no one laughs, don't use that joke. If you try several jokes out on people and no one laughs, maybe you shouldn't start with an attention getter as a joke. That might not be your strength. Look for stories, statistics, quotes. Um, another danger with uh, jokes is sometimes they're interactive, like the knock-knock jokes or the riddles. You might get someone responding. If you don't want them to respond, you need to make that clear up front. The same thing with questions, which is the first one in the list in chapter two. It's easy because everybody can ask a question. It's very easy to make your question relate to the topic. If I were doing a speech on stamp collecting, I could ask, does anybody in here collect stamps? I know that stamp collecting is not a popular hobby now, so probably nobody's gonna raise their hand. I might wanna start with that one. Even though it directly relates to my topic, it doesn't engage people very well. But if I show a picture of a very rare stamp, especially if it's a very rare stamp that I found when I was collecting stamps, and ask, maybe now I'd ask the question, how much do you think this stamp is worth? And you're thinking two, three bucks, and I say it's $1,000, then that might get your attention. And you think, oh, stamp collecting's a little more important than I thought, perhaps. Maybe I'll listen and see what else he tells me that I don't know. Um, questions, again, just like jokes, can sometimes be interactive. It implies 
I'm expecting an answer. One of the reasons questions work is because we recognize the inflection, we know it's a question, and we think they may be asking me a question, I might need to respond. So we pay attention. We are culturally trained to alert to questions. But likewise, some people really want to answer those questions, especially if it's a controversial topic. Did anybody see that political debate the other night? Well, I did. I saw it. That guy was a nut. I would never vote for that guy. You don't want that. That response does not further your speech. It distracts from your speech. So if you're asking that kind of a question, can it, could I see a show of hands? How many people watched the political debate the other night? And then they know I don't need to talk. I just raise my hand. Um, questions are easy, so they're probably overused more than any of the others. You might want to look for some other options if you can be creative. We talked about quotes and jokes. Moving on to the next one, stories. Your 1C assignment is to tell a personal story. Here's something about me. I told the, used the example of my, me buying the Batman tie that I wore the first day of class. Very simple story that tells you something about me. If I were doing a speech about collecting ties, I could use that story. If I were doing a speech about collecting stamps, it doesn't really relate. But I could tell a story about my friend who found the thousand dollar stamp. Or if I'm doing a story about space travel, I might talk about meeting an astronaut when I was younger, and that, how that influenced me to want to be an astronaut and travel in space. Another type of story, it doesn't involve you, it's a historical story, and it could be very historical, somebody like Plato or George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, or it could be close history, my grandfather, my mother, Somebody other than me, and it happened in the past, would be historical. It doesn't have to be in a history book. And it doesn't even have to be real. The third type that the book talks about are hypothetical stories. If I'm going to do a speech about getting your life organized, I might start off with a story. Imagine next Monday morning. You're getting ready for class. It's been a long weekend, so you're gathering your books from around the house. You're getting your things ready to go, and you can't find your car keys. 30 minutes later, you open the refrigerator, and there they are. Now, obviously, this is not a real story because next Monday has not come yet. But it is the kind of story that can allow your audience to project themselves into the situation that leads to your speech. Yes, I've been in that situation. I've been in a similar situation. Maybe I should listen to the speech and see what recommendations the speaker has. So stories are good, and you can use statistics and quotes and research, but if you want people to care about your topic, you really need to tell some stories because stories make it personal and they carry emotional impact. Also, you could use activities. Activities are a little more difficult. Uh, they require more planning on your part. You don't want your activity to be longer than the rest of your speech, so that's a warning there. But there are some topics that really need an activity to go along with them. How many of you have done the Myers-Briggs personality inventory? It used to be very popular. There's still usually two or three students who have done it. And it has four personality types, and each type has two characteristics. One of them is your level of um, outgoingness, I guess, for lack of a better term. There are two types, introvert or extrovert, and there is a simple four-question quiz that will help you identify which extreme you are or which side of the... the uh, continuum you fall on. If you take the long test, it's probably 100 to 150 questions, and it will give you exactly where you are in the continuum. You're maybe at 85 or 75. Uh, the short question just says more this or more that. 
Uh, introvert, extrovert is the first category. And the question is, when you go to a party or you're around a group of people, at the end, has that taken energy from you or given you energy? And my wife and I are very different on that. She's around a bunch of people. She needs to come home and get some quiet time by herself because it's taken a lot of her energy. I'm with a group of people and I get energy from that. I leave and I'm hyped up. So I'm an extrovert, she's an introvert. If I ask my audience those four questions, have them take out a piece of paper, score themselves, answer those questions, here's your personality type. Now as I lecture about these types, you can apply this information to you. What would have been a long, boring speech now has some personal impact. So that activity could be important. And then the last one are uh, magnitude or statistics. And this is not a statistics class, so we're just going to be simple. Three types of statistics. Magnitudes, trends, and segments. Magnitudes show the impact of a problem or an issue. For instance, right now in the news, if you look at the news, you'll see a lot of magnitudes showing reports on coronavirus. New cases, new deaths. And usually those are presented as large numbers. Uh, especially nationally, statewide, by county, it's not quite as big of a number, but your population is a lot smaller. So, you know, 15 people in a county population is a lot more impact than 15 people in a state. Likewise, we don't think of six as being of, of magnitude, but if you have a class of 15 people and you say, over the next year, research shows that six of you will be the victim of identity theft, and you look around and you say, that's about half the people. That's a magnitude. Nine out of 10 dentists recommend Crest. That's a magnitude, even though it's a small number. So magnitudes show the impact. Trends show the change. A lot of coronavirus data is going to be reported as a chart of some sort. So a bar chart like this shows a trend of increasing cases. We hope this will level off and start to go down in the future. That would be a trend of decreasing cases. That's that curve that we talked about, flattening the curve. So that would be a long-term trend of going up and then back down. If we have 15 cases a day, every day for a week, that's a straight line. So a lack of increase or decrease is still a trend. It shows change over time. Segments take a population and break it down into a smaller number. So how many people, let's just do a quick example. How many people drive a red car? Silver or gray, I'm gonna put those two together. White. Black. Other. So, if I put this into a pie chart, okay, actually that should have been a little bit bigger probably right there. So I have a quick comparison of this population and what are the car colors. Now, why would I ever want to know this kind of information? If I own an automobile dealership and I'm ordering cars, I don't want to order a lot of yellow cars because nobody owns a yellow car in here. So yellow would be right there, a line of zero. But I might want one, I don't want to order 15, but I might want to order one because it's so different I'll put it out on the front lot as people drive by, they'll notice, ooh, there's a yellow car. I'm gonna drive in 
and by a white one, but the yellow one caught my attention. So I'm going to order more silver, black, white, red. Oh, that's it. I left out red. Oh, there's red. Um, if I sell insurance and statistics tell me that red cars are in automobile accidents more than white cars, and you own a red car and you want a policy from me, I want to know that information. Now we have to look at the difference between causal and casual or alternative causes. Do red cars get more traffic t speeding tickets or get in more accidents just because they're red? Probably not. Now, I drive a silver car. It's kind of the same color as the road. If I pass a police officer and he doesn't notice me because my car's silver, but if it was red, he might say, oh, there's a red car. I better check and see how fast this guy's going. Maybe there's a relationship to speeding tickets there, but maybe it's the fact that people who make sports cars are more likely to paint them red than silver or white because red seems like a sporty color. And sports cars get more tickets than minivans. So that might be part of it. But if I'm gonna order a bunch of minivans, I'm probably not gonna get a lot of red ones. I'll go with white, black, silver. Because that's maybe more the color for minivans. So that's how uh, statistics could be used in life, but also in your speech as your attention getter. So from your 3B speech forward, you will need an opening attention getter. Something out of this chapter is a good, safe way to go. And again, if you want to be sure, then grab something out of there. A quote is something that somebody else says. If I just want to start off with something I said, that's not really a quote, and it really is not an attention getter out of chapter two. So if you can go back and find it in chapter two, you're safe, you can get credit for that, if not, it's kind of dangerous.